Good morning, everyone. I am going to talk to you today about PC and console gaming, what's the current state of uh, the market, and some latest trends that are going to shape the future of it. Uh, thank you very much for being here, and I hope you enjoy. So just a quick introduction before we dive uh, deep into the topic of the presentation on who I am and where I come from. I'm uh, Guilherme Fernandes, market consultant at NewZoo. NewZoo is the global leader in games and esports analytics. Um, our, ranges, our range of products and services goes from market forecasts that we publish um, quarterly uh, in our reports. We have also tracker products that look into streaming data, PC hardware, top PC titles, and other um, trackers. And we also have consumer insights that's part of our research department that does a lot of syndicated and custom research to answer some of our clients' uh, most important questions. So just a quick overview of what we're going to be covering today. First, what's the current state of the games market? Then, what are New Zoo's 2020 predictions? And thirdly, the, some other key factors that will affect the games market in 2020. So this first section has a lot of numbers. Uh, don't be too, too bummed out by that. Just going to highlight some of the key figures that I want you to, to keep from this. So let's start with looking at the overall games market size for 2020. We predict that the games market is going to reach just over 160 billion US dollars this year, with 48% of it coming from Asia Pacific. Uh, but the fastest growing region is actually going to be the, the smallest one, that is Latin America. 49% of all the consumer spend this year will come from China and US, with China being the biggest mar market by a small margin. If we want to take a look at the forecast in 2022, um, we see that uh, APAC is going to continue to be the biggest region, and the overall games market is going to reach uh, just under $190 billion by 2022. And the regional shares will actually remain quite stable as they've been since 2018. Going from regions to segments and devices, uh, mobile is going to continue to be the biggest um, segment in the games market with 47% of the total. <coughs> Sorry, a bit of a cough today. Um, f followed by console and PC. Console has been having quite a, few, quite a strong growth in the last few years, but uh, we predict that because of the new console gen that's coming at the end of the year, people's budget is going to focus a little bit more towards the hardware side not, and not the software side. So we see that the games, uh, uh, software sales are going to drop. The growth is going to slow down a little bit, but still growing at 6%. Looking at the forecast 2020, for 2022 in the devices as well and segments, we have mobile continuing to have very strong growth and gaining some of the market share from the other two segments. But um, even though the, st the, the shares for PC and console are uh, either stable or decreasing, we do, see, we do say that they're going to continue to grow in absolute terms. Looking at genres inside of console and PC, the overall favorite continues to be, or, or continue to be in 2019, um, shooters and fighters. Um, but it's curious to see that in console, action adventure has a much bigger stake than in PC, where that is kind of substituted by role-playing games. And one cool thing that I want to show you guys is data on a title uh, level on a title level. So this comes from our newly released analytics platform where we combine pretty much all of the data sources that I mentioned in the beginning, so our, our market forecasts, our tracker products, and some of our research into one single location. That's NewZoo's analytics platform. And here you can see um, what we have for uh, top games, of top PC games in Q4 2019. So it's a very nice tool that lets you just take a look. And by player share, we see that we have League of Legends at, uh, at the top by a very big lead, followed by Counter-Strike, uh, Global Offensive, and Rainbow Six Siege. 
So just one quick insight, uh, one of the many things you can check in our platform. Um, so having taken a look at the numbers and where we are, or where we're going to be this year, let's just take uh, one look at how we are going to get there. So what are going to be the major things going on this year uh, and what do we predict is going to happen? So let's start by saying that emerging markets will drive growth, okay? So this is true on just an overall level, including mobile, but also if we exclude mobile. So if you include mobile, we're seeing uh, LATAM, uh, in the Indian subcontinent, we have MIA, and we have Southeast Asia as the major sources of growth. But when we take mobile out, India and Southeast Asia continue to be a major, the major sources of growth for both PC and console. So only after this does Western Europe and North America show up as the, the biggest uh, growth markets for PC and console. The second one is that 2020 is going to be the year of subscription gaming, but not necessarily cloud gaming yet. Okay, so everyone has been talking a lot about cloud gaming, but we at NewZoo think that it's still uh, like five, seven, maybe a bit more years down the line to, uh, to having actually something really big coming out of cloud gaming. Uh, but 2020 is, sur is surely going to be the, a big year for subscription gaming. We've seen that music and video have already had their subscription revolutions, and the same is going to happen um, to gaming. It has already been happening a bit, but 2020 is definitely going to be the biggest year so far. Um, and this is going to lead to a major uh, dispute over content. So everyone wants to have the best content in their platforms, in their services, because if not, why are players going to go and choose you instead of your competitor? Um, and this is going to drive a lot of, um, a lot of just competition for the, this content and the best content. And this competition might lead to some subscription fatigue. It's a bit of a risk that we face in the market right now that if everyone has their, the best content locked away behind some sort of uh, barrier, is it a paywall or just downloading a launcher, then Gamers, particularly, they don't really like that. We've seen the reaction of the community um, recently to this content exclusivity. So, yeah, it's kind of something to keep in mind. And game subscription is also going to have another major effect in the, <coughs> in the monetization structures of games. We've seen how free-to-play impact, uh, impacted the market and how it changed monetization massively. And when game subscriptions really kick in, we're going to have new ways of measuring uh, user acquisition and retention and new ways of, monetize, of, of monetizing games. And gaming subscriptions and cloud gaming to some degree are also going to have a major impact this year on publishers and their roles. We predict that publishers are going to continue to uh, specialize and just going to be a huge shift in how publishers interact with the market. So they had the traditional role that we've seen in the past of focusing on distribution, PR, marketing and sales, and with a bit of, more of an investor side, but not very, not very focused on that. And more recently, we've seen this investor side of publishing really kicking in, where they just uh, let developers do their own thing, and they provide the funds for the development process. And some of them also just combine all in one. So we had developer publishing and online distribution all in one go. But we think that because of gaming subscription, there's a very high likelihood of this role being increasingly specialized into three possible alternatives. So the first one is that they're going to act more, of as, more as a platform or a service. Uh, well, where they just run a subscription or a cloud gaming service, for example. The second one is that they become IP holders. So they just own the IP and they license the rights off to many different studios to develop the game. Then they might just double down on what they are, they've been doing so far. So really focusing on marketing and user acquisition and uh, just showing how they add value to developers. But with all of this uncertainty in the market and big trends uh, coming up, and 
there's one thing that might happen is that not all of the publishers might last this transition. So just something to keep in mind, not to be the forerunner of bad news, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's bound to happen. There's always risk in all of these transitions. Last prediction is that 2020 is going to be the turning point for VR. So there's already in the market quite a lot of different alternatives and uh, for, in terms of hardware for VR, different selling point, different uh, price, price points. Um, but one thing that's still missing is um, software. So where is the software that's going to bring people into VR in a major way? And I'm sh pretty sure almost all of you know that Valve has announced Half-Life Alyx. That's going to be a VR exclusive um, gaming experience. And this is really interesting to see. It's Valve bringing one of their top franchises that hasn't had a single game being launched in years, and everyone has been talking like, where's Half-Life 3 and, th and so on. And they come up and announce a VR uh, game. So this is massive, and it's really going to be make it or break it for the market in terms of VR. So if Valve does not uh, bring in the, the customer, the, the player base, with such a big franchise, then it's very unlikely that anything will. So a big year for VR, um, 2020 is going to be a big year for VR. So having taken a look at our predictions, just let's take a look at other key factors that will either happen or have already happened but have, are going to have a major impact in 2020. First of all, of course, I have to talk about the new console gen. Uh, there's going to be PS5 and Xbox Series, Series X uh, going to be released these holidays at the end of the year. And these are shaping up to be quite expensive pieces of hardware. So, with this new console gen coming along, it might also be just one trigger for people to start considering cloud gaming more seriously, which is why I have Stadia also showing up there, even though they launched in November last year, and other services, as you are probably aware. Then we have that games have never been more integrated with brands. The key example, the, or the best example of this is Fortnite. As I'm pretty sure you also know, they have tons of in-game events, so they're everywhere. They have uh, partnerships and collaborations with Star Wars in-game, like showing uh, <coughs> trailers uh, and so on. And we had uh, Marshmallow having an in-game event, an in-game concert that was huge, had a really big audience, and just other collaborations with uh, Nike, uh, Nike Air Jordan, uh, just some examples of everything that they're doing. We also had Louis Vuitton, one of the most pre premium brands in the world, going into games and uh, creating the trophy case for uh, the World Championships trophy for League of Legends. They created the female first clothing line based on the LOL uh, IP. We also had skins for in-game uh, characters uh, based or made by Louis Vuitton. And thirdly, in this, we also have an another very big trend that's video games going into board games. Uh, one key example, or one, one good example, being Rebellion with Sniper Elite. Another key factor is that PC and consoles do not, no longer have the, the exclusive on the core gameplay experience. We've seen last year Call of Duty Mobile being launched over 100 million downloads in the first week. It was the best uh, week launch, uh, launch week for any mobile game ever. And so it's a really big shift, and we're starting to see really uh, premier franchises that are typically console or PC exclusive going into mobile. And also we have the resurgence of premium games. So we have uh, Apple Arcade and Google Play Pass sh coming along and bringing back premium games into, uh, into mobile that was a bit uh, missing uh, lately, as you're probably aware. And last key factor that we have is that we have a lot of convergence in the way that um, games monetize across PC and console and uh, mobile. We have from mobile to PC and console more and more frequently uh, multiple currencies, login rewards, and light versions. And in the reverse direction, we have the battle pass, uh, battle passes showing up on, in mobile titles and licensing IP. And let me just take the last few moments of my presentation to talk to you about News News Indie Month. We are running a bunch of special offers until the, uh, the 15th of February. 
uh, just for indies. So we have NewZoo Pro, which is a subscription service uh, to our the games uh, analytic platform um, that gives you another level of depth into of all of our insights that we have in that platform that I showed you a little bit uh, before for a, an exclusive price for indies until the February, uh, February 15th. We also have the game development solution, which I can talk to you a little bit more about after this presentation if you want to hear more about it for a special price for indies and also an indie exclusive free report. Uh, that you can download now from our website. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm Glenn Fernandes from New Zoo, and I'll be taking questions if you have them. Um, we are currently working on really redefining uh, the game's taxonomies. So we are d developing right now, and that you can check that in our games, plat games platform, our analytics platform. Um, and because we, we, are, we acknowledge that action adventure is really broad and it's kind of hard to figure out where one game is and, what, and where another one is. And in our new taxonomy, we say that, uh, we say that um, Assassin's Creed, that was your example, is an adventure game. And um, <coughs> I can't give you a very detailed uh, definition right now because it's quite long. Where we go like in really specific because we have, I think, like 15 different genres. So like that split, we had a few, a lot, a lot less. Um, but the action adventure, yeah, I would say that in that definition that we had before, we have something like uh, Tomb Raider in there. We also have Assassin's Creed. We have uh, Uncharted. Uh, we have um, those, those sorts of, of, of games where you really have a narrative component going into it and just a lot of uh, action going on. Okay? Yeah? I just wanted to probe a little deeper about your uh, analysis of VR in 2020. Yes. Yeah. Um, I agree, Half Life Alex will be super exciting, but if I remember correctly, it's exclusive to the Valve Index, right? Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I know that they've already sold out the Valve Index in most of in like pretty much everywhere, uh, and I'm not sure if they've announced it's exclusive yet or if you can go with Oculus or something like that. Well, I was just wondering what like that uh, how that affects the uptake of VR more broadly across the year because if it's limited to one headset, then yeah. that's still going to limit its impact on the. It's going to limit, and Index is a really expensive uh, piece of hardware, uh, but. It has sold out. Like, of course, they sell it sold out, but you never know. Okay, but how many units do you actually sell? Because it's sold out, you can just sell 1K and it's sold out. Um, but then it's, it's more about just bringing VR and bringing people into VR. And if people have one really good experience in one platform, or even if they try it out in some sort of game show every, uh, anywhere where Valve goes and they have, hey, come here, try it out, <clears throat> then they might, even if it's exclusive to one platform, they might not have the... the the budget or the willingness to go for that platform specifically, but they might be interested and just get another piece of hardware in and another game, like something like a uh, Beat Saber or something like that, and really like that. So it's just bringing players' awareness that VR is such a big thing with a really big franchise like um, Half-Life. Um, subscription services including the cloud gaming services or without them? Game Pass, PlayStation Now. Uh, yeah. So PlayStation Now is really interesting that it was kind of left alone to its own for quite so, quite so many years, but now they really revamped it and it seems that they achieved really big rev uh, growth this year because of the price cut and new games going into it. Um, it was really 
nice to see and also we kind of were expecting something to come out of PlayStation now because Xbox have been, has been uh, just gearing up for the next gen so heavily with um, Game Pass and just making one ecosystem out of the whole Xbox experience. Uh, so it was kind of uh, written on the wall that um, PlayStation would do something, but it's nice to see that they are paying more attention to, to, to now and to their uh, uh, cloud uh, offer, even though you can also download the games there. Um, we think that um, Xbox so far is uh, really trying to make amends from last gen. Uh, it's, uh, it seems like they're doing their homework properly this time. Um, it's going to be, I, I, I don't know. I don't know who is going to be in the, in the, in the lead this time around. Um, uh, it's just really, really nice to see that this, all of this competition and not just everyone re leaning very heavily to, towards one single platform. Um, yeah, so there's, there, there's that and there's also uh, on the cloud gaming side, uh, as we've mentioned, we do think that it's still lagging a bit behind on the gaming experience, so there's still some work that needs to be done, um, but eventually it can be quite a revolution in, in, in the games market. Thank you.